And we are here this morning to study God's Word. We're students of the Scripture. So we're going to look at two passages of Scripture this morning. So go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 24. That's where we're starting briefly. And then we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. That's where we'll spend uh, the bulk of our time this morning. We are considering uh, the events that are taking place right now in the Middle East and the ongoing conflict there, the tensions that have literally existed for years, decades, even centuries, and how those things line up with Bible prophecy, specifically a passage in Ezekiel that's often referred to as the Gog and Magog prophecy. Now, again, to kind of set the stage, Matthew chapter 24, the disciples come to Jesus one day and they ask him, what's going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus in this chapter begins to describe several things, and you know this. He says, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation, pestilences and earthquakes in various places, literally all things that could be ripped out of today's news. But Jesus then says this, when these things start to happen, he says, it's not the end. He says, it's the beginning of sorrows. And if you are a note taker, you may want to underline that word sorrows and off to the side, write birth pains. That is literally what that word means. Now, later in this chapter, Jesus is going to say that nobody knows the day or the hour of the Lord's return. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul tells us that we can know the times and the seasons, because they come as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. Why is that significant? Well, because we know that when it comes to labor pains, okay, my wife has had five children, the pattern is always the same. Once the labor pains start, they begin to grow in intensity and frequency until the time of the delivery. And we could talk about every single one of these things that Jesus mentions in Matthew chapter 24 and how they are increasing in frequency and intensity. As an example, Jesus mentions how there will be earthquakes in various places. There's an animated map here somewhere right there. This is an animated map of all the earthquakes that have taken place around the world in the past 15 years. Between 1900 and 1969, there were roughly six major earthquakes every 10 years. But according to recent data, major earthquakes now occur more than once a month. And great earthquakes every year. NBC News reported that between 2004 to 2014, earthquakes with magnitudes of 8.0 or more rattled the globe at an increase, listen to this, of 265% over the entire previous century. Jesus mentions wars and rumors of wars. Now, we could say that war has always been there, which is true, but every major world war has happened in this last century. There's a graph here that details the increase in armed conflicts between 1946 to 2017. Dr. David Jeremiah writes that it's been reported that 50% of all research scientists in the world are working in the area of arms development. There is at least 4,000 pounds, pounds of explosives for every man, woman, and child on the earth. That boggles the mind. By 2019, global military spending grew to an astonishing $1.92 trillion. Now, what does Jesus say about this? Does he say when these things start to happen, freak out? No. He says it's not the end, but it is the beginning of the world going into labor and that these things would continue to grow in frequency and intensity until the end. But then he adds, see that you are not troubled. In Luke 21, he says, don't be terrified. In both passages, he says, these things must come to pass. Down in verse 25, Jesus says, watch because you don't know what hour your Lord is coming. In verse 44, he says, be ready. In verse 28, he says, when these things begin to happen, what are we supposed to do? He says, look up. He says, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. So now, with that as an introduction, I want to turn to Ezekiel chapter 38. Again, where we're going to spend the bulk of our time this morning 
We want to consider the recent attacks in Israel <clears throat> and the war that Israel has now declared for the first time in 50 years in light of what Scripture has to say. And as you're turning there, um, I do feel like I should at least rehearse why, why does there always seem to be conflict in the Middle East? I don't want to assume that everyone here is a student of Scripture, so let, let's at least talk about this for a few moments because it literally all goes back thousands of years. Genesis chapter 12, God speaks to a guy named Abraham or Abram, who is the father of the Jewish people, by the way. And God says to him, get out of your country and from your family to a land that I will show you. Now that's important, a land that I will show you. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. We call this the Abrahamic covenant. And part of the promise that God makes to Abraham is for a specific piece of land. And the Bible describes this land in tremendous detail. Again, Dr. David Jeremiah writes, all the land from the Mediterranean Sea as the western boundary to the Euphrates River as the eastern boundary. Ezekiel fixes the northern boundary at Hamath, the southern boundary at Kadesh. He says, if Israelis occupied all the land that God promised Abraham, they would control all the holdings of present-day Israel, Lebanon, and the west bank of Jordan, plus substantial portions of Syria, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. Now that's in the Bible, okay? That's not an American political viewpoint. So God makes this promise to Abraham to give this land to all of his descendants. There's only one problem. Abraham has no children. And his wife, Sarah, is barren. She's not able to have children. So Sarah and Abraham come up with this plan for Abraham to impregnate one of his servants, a woman named Hagar. By the way, this was an accepted practice in the day. It was sort of a, mother, a surrogate motherhood program. And so Abraham has a son through Hagar, whom he names Ishmael. Okay, good. Everything's good. God can fulfill his promise now because Abraham has a son. Well... 13 years later, God shows up and he says, I'm going to bless Sarah, your wife, and I'm going to give you a son by her. And you shall call his name Isaac, and I'm going to establish my covenant with him, meaning the promise of the piece of land. Now, Abraham, suddenly realizing his own folly, falls on his face before the Lord and says, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. In other words, God, will you recognize the son that I already produced? Because the promise is to Abraham's descendant, but now Abraham's about to have two sons. So who does the land belong to? Well, I just read it a moment ago, Genesis 17. God says, Sarah's going to bear you a son. You shall call his name Isaac and I will establish my covenant with him. And if you know your Bible history, you know that Isaac has two sons. One of them is named Jacob, whose name gets changed to Israel. And in Genesis chapter 35, God appears to Israel and says, the land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I am giving to you. So the land goes to Israel. But what about Ishmael? What about Abraham's other son? Here's where things get sticky, okay? In Genesis 17, God says about Ishmael, as for Ishmael, I have blessed him, and I'm going to make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly and make him a great nation. And there's this prophecy about him in Genesis chapter 16 where the Lord says he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him and he will dwell in the presence of his brothers, which is interesting. But he says, my covenant is with Isaac. Why take the time to go into all of that? Because listen, the Jewish people descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel, and they rightly believe that the land God promised to Abraham belongs to them. But if you do the lineage, you know that the Muslim people descended from Ishmael 
And they believe that the promise of the land went from Abraham to Ishmael and the land belongs to them. So you literally have two people groups living in one part of the world, literally two brothers who both believe that the land God promised is to them. They both believe that they have a divine claim to a specific piece of land, and that is why the fighting in the Middle East is always so fierce and ongoing, because they believe it is their God-given right that the land belongs to them. The Jews believe it's theirs. The Muslims believe it's theirs. Now, as we approach the prophecy in Ezekiel 38 and 39, I'm going to throw out this disclaimer, okay? I'm going to teach what I believe this passage is about. Are there other interpretations? Of course there are. As Bible commentator David Guzik writes, the battle described in Ezekiel 38 and 39 has interested interpreters and students of the Bible since ancient times. It presents a difficult problem without an entirely clear solution. But in short, here's a summary of what happens in Ezekiel 38 and 39. They describe a massive military attack that comes against Israel by a confederation of geographic nations which surround Israel, and at the height of this battle, God himself is going to intervene and supernaturally protect Israel, and this results in Israel finally acknowledging who God is and the Lord being magnified throughout the whole earth. <clears throat> That's a quick summary of what these chapters are about. Now, first thing we want to notice about these chapters is mentioned twice. First, in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 8, and then again in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 16, Ezekiel writes, In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword. In verse 16 he says, It will be in the latter days that I bring you against my land, so the nations may know me, when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. My point is, these verses make it clear that the prophecy we're about to look at, Ezekiel 38 and 39, applies to the latter days, or the latter years. Bible commentator John B. Taylor writes, The attack of Ezekiel 38 and 39 will come to pass in the latter years, a clear eschatological indication. Now, this may shock everyone, but the context of Ezekiel chapter 38 is Ezekiel chapter 37. And to further shock everyone, the context of Ezekiel chapter 37 is Ezekiel chapter 36. Okay, so my point is, the things that we read in Ezekiel 38 and 39 can't happen until the events that take place in chapter 36 and 37 take place. Well, what happens in Ezekiel chapter 36? Verses 17 through 38, the Lord says, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways. Therefore, I poured out my fury on them, and I scattered them among the nations. But, he says, I had concern for my holy name. Therefore, I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, meaning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel. So, Ezekiel chapter 36 is all about the people of Israel being gathered from all the different nations around the world where they were scattered and brought back into their own land, which remarkably happened in 1948 when as the result of the atrocities committed by Hitler and the Nazis against the Jewish people, the world for a brief moment took pity on the Jewish people and gave them their own land back. A remarkable fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And then Ezekiel chapter 37, it's a very famous passage of scripture. We call it the Valley of Dry Bones prophecy. It's a passage where now that Ezekiel is in their own land, God assembles the bones of the nation and then he begins to add muscle and sinew and skin and flesh until eventually those bones stand on their feet again as a great army. That is all the context 
for Ezekiel chapter 38 and chapter 39 because what we read in chapter 38 can't happen until what happens in chapter 36 and 37 takes place first. Have we seen the Jewish people gathered back to their own land? Yes, we absolutely have. Since that time, have we seen the Lord slowly add to them to where they've become a great nation? Yes, we absolutely have. So now the stage is set for the prophetic events that take place of Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, a prophecy that we already established is for the latter days or the latter times. So let's read through this passage and consider some things. In Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now the name Gog does not seem to have any particular significance. Gog was not one of Israel's ancient enemies like Babylon or the Philistines. Uh, the name literally means mountain. It only appears in Ezekiel 38 and 39 once in Revelation chapter 20, which we'll talk about later. And then there's an obscure verse in 1 Chronicles chapter 5 where a man by the name of Gog is listed amongst Reuben's grandsons, but there's no connection from any of those passages to this one. But we're told whoever this Gog is, that he is of the land of Magog. Now, Jewish historian Flavius Josephus identified the land of Magog as the land of Scythia, a mountainous region around the Black and Caspian Seas. Bible scholar Joseph Alexander writes, this position is generally accepted. Again, Dr. David Jeremiah writes, if you trace back in history, you will find that Magog is a land surrounding Russia, which he calls, and I think this is just a good way to remember it, the Stan nations. So Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, even Afghanistan. These are all nations that used to be part of the Soviet Union. Now, verse 2 also says that this mysterious Gog is the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Modern language experts have no difficulty linking the terms Meshach and Tobol to the modern-day cities of Moscow and Tobolsk in Russia. Another possibility is that Meshach is connected to Moskia or Mushki, which is a mountainous region of the country of Georgia and the Armenian peoples. There, there is also a city named Tbilisi, which could be Tobol, but again, still that general part of the world. So this brings us to the phrase where Gog is referred to as the Prince of Rosh. Now some people suggest that the word Rosh is the Hebrew word for Russia. And that what's being described here is a prince or a leader of modern day Russia. Both Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 15 and Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 39 verse 2 refer to Rosh as being in the far north. So that description or location would fit in connection to where Israel is located. The Imperial Dictionary of the English Language writes, evidence exists of an ancient people called Rosh, supposed to be the original stem from which the modern Russians divide, derived their race and name. Rosh, taken as a proper name in Ezekiel, signifies the inhabitants of Scythia from whom modern Russians derived their name. Wilhelm Jacinius, who was a language expert and a Bible scholar, also regarded Rosh as indicating the Russians who are mentioned in the Byzantine writings of the 10th century under the name Ros. Andrew B. Davidson, who was a professor of Hebrew and Oriental languages, states, we must conclude that Ezekiel's episode of Gog's invasion points irrefutably to the Russians. Okay, so that is one point of view. And I do believe that there is a lot of merit to that. Now, there is another possibility. And that possibility is that the word Rosh here doesn't necessarily refer to an earthly leader at all. The Hebrew word Rosh, the actual Hebrew word, means chief or first or head. So if you think of a Hebrew celebration, Rosh Hashanah, that literally means the head of the year, and so it's celebrated as the Jewish New Year. 
So it's possible that what we see here, Gog of the land of Magog, the, the prince of Rosh, that could be translated Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince. In fact, the old King James version of the Bible and the NIV and the ESV and the CSB and many other translations, this is how they render this verse. I am against you, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tobal. So it could be an earthly leader, but it's also possible this could refer to a demonic entity who holds sway over and influences events in that part of the world. Kevin, what are you talking about? Daniel chapter 10, for you students of the Bible, you'll remember this. Daniel's been praying for three weeks and an angel shows up. And the angel tells him, Daniel, from the time you started to pray, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. But he says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Now, that's not a reference to an earthly king. That's a reference to a fallen angel, a demon who had dominion over the Persian part of the world. How do we know that? Because the angel says that who came to help him fight against the prince of Persia was Michael, one of the archangels, who's referred to as the chief prince. So I can't imagine that an angel would need Michael, the archangel, the chief prince, wouldn't need his help to take on an earthly leader. And in fact, the angel goes on to say, when I'm done from here, I got to go fight with the prince of Persia again. And when I'm done fighting with him, the prince of Greece is going to stand up and begin to fight with me. My point is the Bible uses this word or this idea of prince to refer to angelic or demonic leaders and authorities. Not in every instance, but in many instances. For instance, in the book of Ezekiel, uh, or the book of Ephesians, when we read that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, Okay, that word principalities is connected to the word prince. It's referring to spiritual beings. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Satan himself is called the prince of the power of the air. Jesus called Satan the prince of this world. By the way, this is why Jesus is called the prince of what? Princes because he's over all of them. My point is this, it is entirely possible when we read about Gog, the Prince of Rosh, the literal translation is Gog, the chief prince, and it could be a reference to a demonic being with influence over events of that part of the world, but either way, whether it's a human leader or whether it's a demonic entity, whether it correlates to modern-day Russia or not, one thing is clear. As Charles Lee Feinberg writes, these chapters tell, if interpreted literally, of a coming confederacy of nations somewhere around the Black and Caspian Seas with Persia and North Africa who will invade the Promised Land after Israel's restoration to it. And while the specific identity of names like Gog and Magog remain mysterious, there are several other names in this passage which are quite clear. Look again at Ezekiel 38, verse 3. The Lord says, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh. Verse 4 says, I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out. So please note, whatever Gog's own motivations are for this attack against Israel, it's actually God himself who's going to draw this leader, this prince, into this battle against Israel. And it won't be pretty, okay? But it will accomplish God's purposes. Now, verse 5 lists Persia, Persia Ethiopia, and Libya are with them. Verse 6 mentions Gomer and all its truce, troops, the house of Togarma from the far north, and its troops... Many people are with you. Okay, so we know where Ethiopia and Libya are. Ancient Persia is modern-day Iran. In fact, I didn't know this, but up until 1935, Iran was called Persia. In fact, the Farsi word for Persia is Iran. 
Now, some suggest that Gomer is Germany. In fact, the Talmud identifies Gomer as Germamia. David Guzik writes, most regard Gomer as people from Cappadocia in modern-day Turkey. Joseph Alexander says Togarma is possibly the ancient Tilgarimu southeast of the Black Sea. Now, if you jump to verse 13, we read of Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish. Sheba and Dedan are understood to be Arabic countries of the Arabian Peninsula. And while the exact location of Tarshish isn't known, it's mentioned all throughout the Bible. And there's some speculation that it could be Phoenicia, which is modern-day Lebanon, Sardinia, which is off the coast of Italy, or even Spain. Now, here's a quick summary. These are going to be a lot of verses, but i got to get through them. So follow along either in your Bible or just turn your attention to the big screen. God says in verse 15, You will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, a great company and a mighty army. You will come against my people like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Jump to verse 18. It will come to pass when Gog comes against Israel, my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the fields, and all creeping things and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down. The steep places shall fall. Every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog Throughout all my mountains, every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. They shall know I am the Lord. Okay, so in the latter days, let me summarize where we're at. In the latter days, a confederation comprising of Ethiopia, Libya, Iran, Turkey, certain Arab countries, possibly Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, maybe portions of Europe, led by a leader from the north, perhaps connected to modern-day Russia, coming against Israel, and God will miraculously step in and defend it with earthquakes, confusion, plagues, and hailstones. Do we see a connection between modern-day Russia and these Asiatic countries? Well, although it's an ever-developing situation, listen to this from Geopolitica. The Collective Security Treaty Organization formed in 2002, bringing together Russia, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kazakhstan, as well as Armenia and Belarus, President Vladimir Putin campaigned on his ambitious plan to build a Eurasian Union, which has broad backing and is moving ahead, building on the customs union already taking place among Russia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus. Russia has attempted to move forward with Turkey, listen to this, towards a new axis that would replace the U.S. presence in the Middle East. Russia has offered Syria and Egypt nuclear power stations. Russia has long worked closely with Iran, just as Russia and Turkey are creating an alliance in the Middle East. Russia and Iran have forged a long-term alliance in Central Asia with implications for Eurasia as a whole. In fact, during Russia's recent invasion of Ukraine, It was Iran who supplied Russia with aerial drones for their attack. If you want to have your mind blown, if you're into that kind of stuff, I am. Just go Google the Eurasian Economic Union. You will have your mind blown at the history and the development that has taken place between Russia and all these Asiatic countries. And what's crazy to me is that a lot of times when we talk about end times, you hear people talk about the European Union all the time. 
Man, if you want to see the setup for Ezekiel 38 and 39, just go read about the Eurasian Economic Union because it's all there. And listen, bear in mind, these are relationships, these are developments that are all relatively recent. Up until the 1970s, which I realize sounds like ancient history to many of the young people in the room, okay? But that wasn't that long ago. Up until 1970, you know who Israel's greatest ally was? It was Iran. It wasn't until 1970 when Iran became an Islamic Republic under the Ayatollah Khomeini that they turned on Israel. And up until a few years ago, Turkey and Israel were allies. In 1999, the strategic partnership between Turkey and Israel had the potential to alter Middle East politics. This blows me away. Trade and tourism were booming. The Israeli Air Force practiced maneuvers in Turkish airspace, and Israeli technicians were modernizing Turkish combat jets. In 2005, the Prime Minister of Turkey visited Israel. Listen to this. Offering to serve as a Middle East peace mediator, he laid a wreath at the Holocaust Memorial and told Ariel Sharon, who at that time was the Prime Minister of Israel, that his Justice and Development Party regarded anti-Semitism as a crime against humanity, adding that Iran's nuclear ambitions were a threat not just to Israel, but to the entire world, and now they're enemies. And this was just a few years ago, guys. And this is interesting, too. According to Lyman Coleman, who is an American scholar and language expert, he wrote the historical geography of the Bible, he identifies Gomer in this passage with modern-day Ukraine, specifically the Crimean Peninsula. So do you begin to see the implications of this developing Eurasian part of the world? Russia and Gomer, Russia and Turkey, Russia and Egypt and Syria, Gog and Magog. And somebody might say, Kevin, well, why would all of these countries come against Israel? Well, again, first and foremost, it's to accomplish God's purposes. But from an earthly standpoint, you've got all the fighting that exists in this part of the world between these Islamic countries, who again, believe the land belongs to them, and Israel, who believe the land belongs to them. And just last year, when Russia attacked Ukraine, who spoke out in defense of Ukraine? It was Israel. Israel spoke out in defense of Ukraine, and immediately Vladimir Putin called out Israel saying it does not recognize its sovereignty in the Golan Heights, and that that land belongs to Syria, and he is committed to seeing a Palestinian state established. Haritz, which is an Israeli newspaper, reported Russia condemned the Israeli occupation of the Golan Heights and said it does not recognize Israel's sovereignty in the region. The statement appeared to be a Russian message to Israel. But even before that, going back to December of 2020, Newsweek, Newsweek magazine ran the headline, Russia calls Israel the problem in the Middle East and defends Iran and its allies. Perhaps this is the hook that God says he's going to put into the jaws of this prince from the north to bring them against Israel. These are literally prophetic developments taking place right before our eyes in the daily news. Now, do I believe that what's taking place right now is the Gog-Magog war? Not necessarily, but I do believe it's the setup for the Gog-Magog war. And what we're beginning to see is all of the players coming into focus who are going to be part of this latter days confederation that marches upon Israel. Now, chapter 39 begins with more or less a summary of this judgment against Gog. So I'm going to skip over several verses here, but there's a couple of things to point out. Uh, if you look in verse 6 of chapter 39, 
The Lord says, I will send fire on Magog and on those who live in security in the coastlands, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 7, I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Okay, so one of the results of this attack from Gog and Magog against Israel is God's protection of Israel, and then Israel will recognize who God is. Again, Bible commentator David Guzik writes, God uses this remarkable victory over Gog and his allies to bring his people to restored relationship. Though Israel was gathered to their land and lived in relative safety, a true relationship with Yahweh had not yet been restored. It will be as the result of this battle. Now, keeping that in mind, let your eye drop down to verse 9 of chapter 39. God says about the aftermath of this battle, and I find this very intriguing, that those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, and notice this, they will make fires with them for how long? Seven years. Okay, now I haven't talked about this all morning long, but these verses are why I believe this reference to Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is not the same reference as Revelation chapter 20. Because the reference to Gog and Magog in Revelation chapter 20 happens after the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ on the earth which is at the end of the Great Tribulation, which is at the end of the Battle of Armageddon. John writes, When the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and go out to deceive the nations which are in the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle. And they went, they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. In that passage, Revelation chapter 20, which is where we're going to be in a couple of weeks, by the way, the subject of that attack are the saints and the holy city. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, the subject of the attack is the nation Israel. In Revelation chapter 20, the attack happens after the 1,000-year reign of Christ. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, the attack happens after the Jewish people have been gathered back to their own land. Also note, again, as the result of the battle in Ezekiel 38 and 39, how long do they burn the weapons for? They burn the weapons for seven years. How long is the Great Tribulation? Seven years. Okay, this is interesting to me because numbers are important in the Bible. Don't forget, too, we mentioned a moment ago from verse 7 of chapter 39, God says, as the result of this battle, he says, I will make known my holy name in the midst of my people, and I will not let them profane my name anymore. Now think about that. Because it seems like what God is saying about Israel is that they're going to be saved at that point. He's not going to let them profane his name anymore. He's going to make himself known among them. So just for grins, let me read to you a cross-reference from another passage. You don't have to turn there, but you can jot it down and look it up later. Zechariah chapter 12. The Lord says this, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day, I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. Okay, so first of all, this is another passage that talks about a confederation of nations coming against Israel. But this is also an important passage because God straight up tells us right here that in the latter days, the entire world's focus is going to be on this narrow strip of desert land in the Middle East. There's no logical explanation for it. It's just a fulfillment of God's prophecy. And the reason it's happening is because of Abraham, thousands of years ago. So there is a little lesson here, right? Be careful when you don't wait upon the Lord. Because Abraham jumped the gun 
And here we are, seven, 8,000 years later, looking at World War III because the guy wouldn't wait for his wife to get pregnant. <laughs> Just a side application, okay? Coming back to Zechariah chapter 12. This is, again, another instance of surrounding peoples laying siege against Israel. And verse 4 says, In that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion, its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Verse 8, In that day, the Lord says, He will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David, and the house of David will be like God like the angel of the Lord before them, it shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Israel. So again, another description of surrounding nations coming against Israel and God himself miraculously stepping in to defend his people. What happens as the result? Verse 10, it's a very famous passage of scripture. God says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Listen to this. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. So the result of this other instance of nations laying siege against Jerusalem and God stepping in to defend his people, the result is an awareness amongst the Jewish people of the identity of God, and he pours out upon them the spirit of grace, and they look on him whom they pierce. This, to me, sounds like when Paul says, all Israel will be saved. And I believe it will coincide with an attack against Israel by a confederation of Eurasian nations led by the Prince of Rosh, the result which God steps in to miraculously defend his people and the Jewish people finally recognize his identity as their Messiah, the aftermath of which is them burning weapons for seven years. Why is that important? Because I believe it's entirely possible and I realize not everybody's going to share my viewpoint on this, but I believe it's entirely possible that you and I will be here to see the Gog-Magog War, or at least the beginning of the Gog-Magog War. And it's very possible that the rapture of the church coincides with the Lord stepping in to defend Israel and them looking on him whom they've pierced. Because when we're raptured, where do we meet the Lord? We meet the Lord in the air. As he steps in, we're taken up. They look on him whom they've pierced, and all Israel gets saved. And then there's another seven years where they burn the weapons, which is the exact same time period as the Great Tribulation. So imagine with me. For a moment, a scenario where a confederation of Russian Islamic states march on Israel, the result of which is a nuclear exchange, because if you read the rest of chapter 39, that's pretty much what it sounds like as described. The rapture of the church happens at the exact same time. Millions of people vanish from planet Earth. All Israel becomes Christians. Can you imagine the chaos that would throw the world into? And now imagine a leader stepping to the forefront of that and saying, I know how we can have peace. I know how we can unite. And we as the world need to come together as one like never before. And in the name of global security, can you see how the world would embrace a leader like that on the result of, as on the heels of something like this? I can't stand before you and say, thus saith the Lord, that that's exactly what's going to happen. But I believe the point of today's message is this. Keep your eyes on the developing situation between Russia 
and this whole band of Eurasian Islamic nations surrounding Israel, because there's a lot going on there that ties into end times prophecy. Now, what do we do about it? Again, I close by going back to something Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24. He says this, when you see these things begin to happen, don't get troubled. Don't be terrified. Be ready, he says, and be watchful. And he says, look up, because your redemption is getting close. And what we need to do as the church, as Christians, armed with the truth of God's word, we need to go out there with the answers that people need and be able to point people to the hope of Jesus Christ. Because guys, he is coming soon. Amen? Amen. And we need to be ready and watchful. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to study your word this morning, and we pray that you would use it, that you would just write your truth on the fleshly tablets of our heart, and you would align our thoughts with your plan. God, so so often, I said this yesterday at the conference, so often, Lord, I'm like Martha. I'm, I'm worried and troubled about many things. But God, make me, make us like Mary, people who just sit at your feet and hear your word. Because you said that's the one thing that is needed, and you also said it would bear fruit that would not be taken away from her. Jesus, you told us that worrying accomplishes nothing, but to to receive your word, and when it sinks down into the good soil of our heart and takes root, it bears fruit to the glory of your name. And you told us straight up that when people see our good works, they'll glorify you. So use your word in us to produce fruit that gives you glory so that people would look upon you and be saved. We love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.